Hello, and welcome to the B2 IP webinar series, hosted by Beach and Bienemann. Beach and Bienemann is a boutique intellectual property law firm based out of Southeast Michigan. I'm Peter Kiros, and today my colleague Tyson Benson will be discussing patent law in 2020, understanding the critical issues and best practices in an ever changing patent law environment. On your screen, you will find a Q&A and chat feature. Please leave all questions in either of these boxes, and we will answer them at the end. Thank you, and we hope you enjoy the presentation. Well, thank you for that kind introduction, Peter. And again, uh, Tyson Benson here uh, with B. Jim Beneman. I'm a patent attorney. And um, yeah, it's an exciting time to be alive with Patent Law uh, 2020. Uh, the roadmap for this webinar is looking a little bit in the past of some of the big cases that transpired or were decided last year, PTAB decisions, uh, patent office guidance, and looking forward uh, to potentially what's coming down the road as well. And so uh, kind of without further ado, let's start kind of with the big case that everyone was talking about on Halloween of 2019. So of course, we're talking about the Arthrex Federal Circuit decision where Federal Circuit panel unanimously held that PTAB um, judges are principal officers, which in which made then their appointment by the Commerce Secretary or the, the appointments by the Commerce Secretary violated the appointments clause because these were found to be principal officers and not inferior inferior officers. Uh, principal officers require presidential appointment and Senate confirmation, whereas, of course, inferior officers can be appointed by the Commerce Secretary. So in that decision, uh, the panel relied upon um, what's called the Edmund factors, which were set forth in the uh, Supreme Court decision, Edmund v. United States, back in 1997. Those factors included whether an appointed official has the power to review and reverse the officer's decision, the level of supervision and oversight an appointed official has over the officers, and the appointed official's power to remove these officers. So it, it's important to note, I think, from this panel decision that the court this panel, um, but the decision found it or, or explained that they, the panel had found it problematic that the secretary and USPTO director lack unfettered removal authority and no uh, other factors weighed in favor of inferior officer status. What I will point out that this is, of course, a panel uh, and we'll find soon find out that uh, not necessarily all of the other judges agree with the um, the the problematic uh, lack lacking unfettered removal authority, as we'll soon find out in a um, decision or a concurring opinion uh, that came out recently. But so additionally, back to the where this Arthrex decision, where the um, administrative patent law judges uh, did not have limited tenure, limited duties, or limited jurisdiction. So the federal court held that the appointments clause violated uh, violation is cured by severing portion of the Patent Act, giving PTAB judges for cause removal protections. So what's important to note here is that they did find that um, the AP, uh, the, the administrative law judges were principal officers and not inferior officers. And so the way that they cured this um, is you know, they took the approach of uh, severing a portion of the statute such that they would then be deemed inferior officers. So um, the PTAB judges could be properly appointed uh, based on the severing of the four cause removal protections and ordered this case to be vacated and remanded uh, to a new panel. So looking forward, um, this decision is currently up for an en banc rehearing. None of the parties, of course, were satisfied with the decision. All three parties have petitioned the federal circuit for en banc review, uh, Smith and Nephew, Arthrex, and the USPTO. The patentee, Arthrex, 
uh, argued that the severance was incorrect and insufficient to convert the principal officers to inferior officers. Uh, the patent challenger and the USPTO want the original decision reinstated and argue that an en banc court should find that the administrative law judges were already inferior judges, and a decision is likely soon whether that the federal circuit will hear this case en banc. Um, what's interesting is that there's some possible impact of how things are going to be moving forward that one should realize with regards to um, their patent prosecution practice and so forth. Uh, just recently, um, in Ray Bolor, um, I'm mispronouncing that, but the, this this um, this case with regards to ex parte examinations, uh, the Federal Circuit had ordered the PTO to submit a brief addressing whether Arthrex should be extended to ex parte examinations. So this will be an interesting piece of, um, and still this came down a couple weeks ago uh, where they've ordered it. And I believe the last time I checked, there was an extension filed. So the brief right now isn't due until uh, in the March timeframe. Um, another interesting decision that uh, this Polaris Innovations versus Kingston uh, was a federal circuit decision handed down uh, just a few weeks ago on January 31st that vacated the PTAB IPR decision and remanded to, to the board for proceedings consistent with the court's decision in Arthrex. What's interesting about this one is that Hughes had a concurring opinion. Uh, since it's a, a precedential decision, um, Hughes said, you know, our hands are tied essentially. We have to go by what was decided in Arthrex. Um, but um, he was opined on some interesting pieces, which um, if this does get hurt or if this does go up to an en banc rehearing, um, it'll be an interesting piece where um, in the concurring opinion, uh, Hughes has laid out a roadmap essentially um, because Hughes's uh, look on what the, um, the panel had decided was that that panel essentially distilled the Supreme Court test into two different questions, not the Edmonds factors, but made their own, um, I guess, interpretation may be a good way to call it, where on the officer's decisions removable by a principal officer and is the officer removable at will. Hughes goes on to say that, providing um, a little bit of what um, Hughes believes, why these are actually inferior officers, because the director has power to direct and supervise the board, individual judges, along with the fact that these judges are already removable under the efficiency of the service standard, suffices uh, to render um, them inferior officers. The director may also issue binding pol policy guidance, institute and reconsider institution of IPRs, uh, select judges to preside over an instituted IPR, and designate or de-designate any Presidential written decisions as presidential and, of course, informative, and convene a panel of three or more members to choosing to consider rehearing of any of these um, board decisions. This goes back to, of course, that POP decision in, uh, or, uh, institute, or when uh, Director Anaku um, went ahead and put together um, the two different pieces of how he was going to update. Uh, the IPRs, and that came down, what, middle of last year. And so this is, um, it goes along with uh, those two pieces that they were updating the IPR. Um, what's interesting as well is this last point where um, he, the Hughes, um, in the concurring opinion, interpreted the panel as, you know, characterizing these, some of these powers as powers of review or, and others as powers of supervision. And regardless of however you interpret this as powers of review or powers of supervision, uh, Hughes viewed them all as significant tools of direction and supervision, which would have not made them a principal officer, but an inferior officer. Um, we're going to transition here from, of course, that Arthrex case to some of the hot topics that are, you know, potentially upcoming um, and so forth. And this was something that was coming out last year um, with some draft texts. Of course, we all know that 101 has been 
uh, more or less a bugaboo for quite some time since Alice came down uh, for patent prosecutors and then those that are litigating. So we've had some draft texts from uh, Senators uh, Tillis and Coons to amend uh, 101 and 112. The important part here is that um, the Section 101 Part B, where eligibility under this section shall be determined only while considering the claimed invention as a whole without discounting or disregarding any claim limitation. Now, of course, or well, what had happened is that the share um, state, or I'm sorry, the stakeholders have come together. And of course, you have a tug of war where some are saying they enjoy this. Um, the 101 where it is right now, and there are some that say we need uh, to unmuddy the waters, so to speak. Well, one of the compromises that the stakeholders were introducing was, all right, if you get 101, then we're going to have an update to Section 112, specifically 112F, where they're going to be removing the claims, uh, the means claim language. So you'll see the updated one proposed 112F where in an element a claim expressed as a specified function without recital of the structure, material, or access support thereof will be construed, shall be construed to cover the corresponding structure, material, or acts described in the specification and equivalence thereof. Now this removes the means for language uh, that we're all so used to that was in section 112 um, where the, some of the issues that have been coming up with this is that some in the biopharma uh, assert that this section creates new patent law and of course is not directly related to patent eligibility. Uh, the issues that potentially people have been arguing against is that um, for everything now, you're going to have to have in your specification uh, pretty much arguably all the different types of combinations of structure or material or, or whatever you wanna uh, do, and you don't potentially get the equivalence that, or that that's where the argument goes, is that you're potentially not gonna be getting the equivalence and it's creating brand new patent law. Um, instead, of course, this is, since this is not actually patent eligibility, it pertains to the requirements in 112 that its patent specification must have adequate enablement and written description requirements. And it's not clear to date in the pile pharma area that functional claims are limited to structures, materials, and facts in the specification. Of course, anything, as we all know, um, takes a little bit to get through Congress and we not, we're not necessarily uh, getting very far potentially with this um, because the most recent status, which came at the IPO um, owner or the IPO association meeting just um, a couple weeks ago at the end of January, um, uh, Senator Tillis um, provided this comment that um, potentially there's not a path forward because um, of the stakeholders haven't been able to come to an agreement where uh, we're going to get 101. The one, so you have Biopharma not wanting necessarily any changes to the 112 and just simply the patent eligibility, whereas um, the other side is looking for more of um, well, if you're going to get 101, we want to update 112. So I guess um, it's going to be a to be continued. Um, and I do believe where I saw um, Senator Coons is scheduled to speak at the um, IPO meeting uh, coming up here in uh, early March. So we may get a little bit more feedback. So it's a to be uh, determined and to be continued. Um, scenario. So moving then, as we were talking about what the proposed statute changes were, we have uh, what came out last January of 2019 and October of 2019, we got some revised guidance from the USPTO. Uh, the big changes, of course, were uh, the primary changes to how patent examiners will apply uh, first step of the Alice Mayo test which determines whether a claim is directed to a judicial exception. It simplifies the what and the how to determine uh, the type of abstract idea. 
and really created a two-pronged inquiry for uh, step 2A, which we're going to go into with the flow charts here uh, very shortly. Um, so right now you see, um, or you might have seen, uh, here is this patent matter subject, uh, the patent matter eligibility test for products and processes. Um, what we're going to be looking at here is, of course, uh, the step 2A and the step 2B, uh, which are the judicial exceptions and the inventive concept that have come out from the Alice uh, Mayo test. So the first one, of course, is the claim directed to um, basically an abstract idea. And then if it is, uh, does a claim recite additional elements that amount to significantly more? Uh, of course, if you get on this track to the left, our left here, uh, to either B or C, then um, you're going to have claims that qualify as eligible under the subject matter. If not, um, they go to this path on the right-hand side, it's not going to be eligible. What the updated guidance then did is it revised or updated and provided some additional prongs uh, that we have that the examiners have to go through for this. So again, if we're going down this middle path here, we're going to is it directed towards basically an abstract idea, law of nature, natural phenomenon? Um, is the abstract idea a math concept, method of organizing human activity, or method uh, mental process? What this what this first prong here does is says these have to be within one of these delineated areas of either a math concept, method of organizing human activity, or mental process. So the examiner has to classify the claim subject matter as in one of those. If the examiner has not done so, then of course it pops out and goes down and it's it's going to be qualified. If the examiner does find that the claim elements uh, are classified in one of these three discrete groupings. Um, we take a look at the additional elements and decide whether or not it integrates into the judicial exception into a practical application. Um, and then, of course, step 2B is still the uh, additional more or um, amount to significantly more than the judicial exception. So uh, to recap or to really hit on the high notes of what this is, um, it we, we talked about that the PTO in prong one has identified the three groups that you need to group the, the claims into. It has to be a mathematical concept, organizing human activity, or a mental process. So if you're getting your office action back, you're taking a look at it, and they're asserting that it's a 101 rejection, they have to classify these claim features into one of these discrete, um, these discrete uh, buckets, so to speak. So again, identify the specific limitations. Um, so the examiner must identify the specific limitations in the claim and then whether they fall into those discrete areas. If it does fall into the discrete area, uh, dis discrete uh, groups, then the analysis proceeds to that second prong, which is um, going to be coming up in the next slide, but um, just continuing to hit on this piece here. So the changes that you should have seen now, um, prior to these updated guidance, examiners would often dismiss the two-A arguments and just say, you know, this is an abstract idea. And there, and there's also no additional elements, boom, uh, popping it out and you're uh, 101 uh, rejected under 101. Revised guidelines uh, make it much more difficult for the examiners to simply dismiss. They have to go through the analysis and they must put it into those buckets or groups um, and say which one it is. And um, so with regards to prong two, they're going to then take a look and see if the claim language is that integrates the judicial exception because you know, presuming we get to prong two, that means they've made a decision that this is one of those three groupings. Um, but do the claim like does the claim language impose meaningful limits on the judicial exception? And so that's going to be the analysis there. And what they're going to look at is, and, and this of course does uh, have some overlap with um, step two B. So. Um, you know, you're going to be making maybe some of the same arguments 
that you have on 2B as you do in this 2A prong 2. But what you're going to be doing is with, of course, with the in fish case, um, an improvement to the functioning of the computer, improvement to other technology. Um, you know, we have um, to affect a particular treatment uh, for a disease or medical condition, um, implements a judicial exception, uh, transforms uh, a particular article to a different state or composition, and um, applies uses in some other meaningful way beyond a technological improvement. So you're going to have to be making an argument that, that goes along with this. And I do, I have pulled um, a PTAB, recent PTAB final decision that uh, upheld or affirmed. Uh, so we're going to be walking through one of those um, decisions here so that you can see what either all, what the PTAB's looking for and what the examiners are looking for and how you can thwart it by improving your specification or updating your specification or providing uh, the types of arguments that you must be able to put forward. But, and so here are, you know, and this is in this decision, we're going to see what didn't work. And it's much along the lines of what, what we have right here, um, which is, certainly the same as what it was before uh, these updated, which is, you know, if it merely recites the words apply it or some equivalent, implementing the abstract idea on a computer, um, using the computer to perform an abstract idea. This is one of the major uh, ones that we or I have been seeing in the PTAP final decisions where it's using a computer as a tool to perform an abstract idea. Um, adds insignificant extra solution activity to the judicial exception. And and so forth, the Bilski and Fluke um, pieces there. So it does not evaluate whether the additional elements are well understood, routine, or conventional activity. That is still step two B. That doesn't mean that you're again going to have you're going to have some overlap in your arguments at prong two in step two B. Um, of the well, you know, because uh, you just have a lot of the, you know, you're going to be arg arguing technological improvement um, in step in prong two, and then at step two B, of course, you're going to say, well, this technological improvement is not well understood, routine, or uh, conventional. Uh, but on the flip side, you could have, you know, these conventional elements that integrate an exception into a practical application, so. You do have this in your toolbox where you're going to be able to, um, you may be able to say that we have do have some conventional elements or concede this point. Um, so you'll be able to pop it out and instead of getting to 2B, um, but again, you may have uh, an uphill battle with the patent examiner uh, when they're arguing that it's conventional elements um, and they don't in integrate it into an exception. Uh, of the practical application. Um, so, you know, we have this, uh, as I've been leading up to it, I'm just letting you know kind of what in practice, but in theory, your conclusions under 2A do not apply automatically to 2B. Again, that where the dichotomy comes down to is you can have the conventional elements that are simply uh, being added to get to, to make it a practical application. But I think you're in a much stronger position, especially talking to examiners and speaking with examiners, if you can um, have your arguments put together of prong two and step two B, because um, they may simply say that uh, this the, the conventional elements um, are just generic computers or along the lines and you're just applying it, uh, so to speak. So uh, just a kind of a word of warning there, but you do under theory, uh, conclusions under step A do not automatically apply uh, to step 2B. Um, it may be better to argue claims apply, rely on you, uh, use the judicial exception in a meaningful manner rather than linking the claims to previously allowed subject matter. Uh, matter. Um, and, and certainly it is possible that the claim does not integrate a recited judicial exception is nonetheless uh, patent eligible. So again, as I alluded to before, we had that updated guidance, which was uh, the different prongs at step two way, 
of prong one and two, um, we had an October 2019 update, which the Patent Office took a look at comments that had been receiving um, and then has provided an update um, after that notice and comment period. Um, and this updated guidance is related to how to consider evidence of improvement, whether an exam a lawyer's assertions or simple assertions will be um, sufficient to overcome that, or what does what do we have to provide in order to the examiner, and what does the examiner's burden of evidence or burden uh, equate to on their side to hit the ball over the net to us? So. The examiners are to analyze these improvements by considering, uh, by, by evaluating the specification and the claims. Um, and they're also to ensure that the technical explanation of the asserted improvement is presented in the specification and the claims reflect that asserted improvement. So we're not going to be able to say, hey, look, examiner, we have uh, our claim elements here and they're really awesome, but we're not going to lay claim to the inserted improvement. I mean, you might have some functional language here. You might have your where in clause, whatever the case may be, you're going to have to be able to show uh, that we're claiming the improvement that we're making. And we're going to have to point to it both in this, uh, the specification and in the claims as well. Examiners are not expected to make qualitative judgments on the merits of the improvement. Um, but if the examiner does conclude that the disclosed invention does not improve the technology, the burden will shift to us, the applicant, to provide persuasive arguments um, supported by evidence to demonstrate that one of ordinary skill in the art would understand that the closed invention improves the technology. Here's where we're going to be thinking about 132 declarations. We're going to have the opportunity or uh, in our toolbox, one of the tools in our toolbox is going to be these 132 declarations where we're going to be able to um, provide evidence um, statements that these are what the one of ordinary skill in the art would recognize the improvement to be but it cannot go outside the bounds of the specification or what one would be able to interpret the specification to be. You can't think of this as uh, adding new matter uh, to where, uh, of course, you would not be able to because these 132 declarations must establish what the specification would convey to one of ordinary skill in the art and, and can't be used to supplement or add uh, something to the specification that wasn't already there. So I want, here's the PTAB final decision that actually I grabbed, and this came out two days ago. This is um, the uh, PTAB uh, upheld a 101 rejection that the examiner had asserted. And we have here um, each of the different pieces that has went through. So this examiner did go through each of um, categorizing it as a abstract idea. And they pointed out the claim language here, this receiving and storing an enrolled patient plan. Um, they put it within the bucket of mental process, which is an abstract idea. Um, and they provided their reasoning why. And so they took a look at it, the support, they or they put the specific claim limitations, and they said, under these limitations, under the broadest reasonable interpretation, a recited mental process can be formed in a human mind or using a, a pen and paper. So finding that it's an abstract idea within one of those three buckets, uh, we move to prong two. And to see if there's additional elements that integrate the judicial exception into a practical application. Um, and the PTAB found that no additional elements or combination elements recited in Claim 8 integrates the judicial exception. And here's the magic language uh, that the, um, I would say that the PTAB was looking for or what you have to assert within your claims, the improvement of the functioning of the computer uh, are applied with any particular machine except for a generic computer transformation or 
not applied in some meaningful way uh, beyond generally linking the use of the judicial exception. Uh, the, the, they took note of what the appellant argued, but those limitations focused on um, are not additional elements that impart patent uh, eligibility to these claims. Uh, step 2B is then, of course, the inventive concept. Um, because we determined that the that they're directed to an abstract idea and it wasn't a practical application, um, the, the elements are merely well understood, routine, and conventional in the field. And considered individually and as order or combin ordered combination, they merely narrow the recited abstract ideas using generic computer components. Uh, of course, uh, there was arguments about NFISH and DDR and... Um, uh, uh, the PTAB had waved these away and said, no, these are just merely, these do not match up with those uh, cases that we typically recite uh, to tr try and overcome these. So here's an example, and what it's meant to illustrate is, practically speaking, we're needing to add those improvements within our claims in the specification, uh, could be saying uh, it increases the computing performance or the processing efficiency or the power consumption, some way that our claimed language is doing this, not merely stating, wow, this is really improving uh, the mental process because, you know, for whatever reason, we, we can't point to um, what could be argued to be a, an abstract idea and simply we're improving the efficiency of the abstract idea. You need to uh, continue to argue that you're improving the underlying technology and so forth. So we're going to be moving into some recent IPR Federal Circuit decisions. And let me say, uh, I did a webinar uh, last week and it was like drinking out of a fire hose uh, because uh, there were a number of Federal Circuit uh, decisions that came out uh, right before the webinar, two hours beforehand. And so, um, had to go over and was trying to take a quick look and summarize that. So I was able to get those slides and luckily uh, nothing came out today uh, that was um, uh, big cases that were uh, deemed precedential by the federal circuit. So, but the, these interesting decisions, some of them have been related in, in of course, 2019, late 2019 and 2020, uh, involve IPR proceedings, uh, declarations, issue preclusion, types of obviousness, challenges. And I think one of the big ones that a lot of people see and uh, hear about are going to be uh, time bar 315B uh, challenges. So the first one that we have is this uh, Arctic Cat versus GEP power. Um, what this was, um, GEP Power, uh, the petitioner, petitioned for IPRs of two patents uh, by the patent owner. Patent owner uh, sought to remove reference as prior art on the basis that the invention was conceived and diligently reduced to practice before the effective filing date of the reference. So basically, they were putting together the declaration that says, hey, the conception and reduction to practice was all done before the filing, uh, so um, pre-AIA. But um, the PTAB concluded that the timeline lacked a sufficiently detailed explanation of events occurring between uh, bookend communications. They found PTAB that the declaration did not adequately account for half the days during the critical period and faulted the, dec the declaration for providing merely conclusory uh, explanations. But, but, Federal Circuit uh, came along because the patent owner appealed uh, the PTAB's finding on diligence and the federal circuit actually and you know i think what I, I haven't seen very many of these diligence um rejections um or findings but federal circuit found that the board's analysis rested on too rigid of a standard and that it actually the record established diligence under the correct standard because the declaration showed the inventor was persistent in moving progress of reduction to practice through multiple states in a timely manner um, and noted that the product specs and test protocols went through five revisions in five months. And during those gaps that the PTAB found, 
The invention was being tested by third party hired for that purpose. So the declaration did set forth facts that did a cover for that gap and that, you know, it wasn't just that the diligence had to be on the inventor himself, him or herself. Um, it was actually going to a third party. So it was diligent through this time uh, of conception and reduction to practice. And so therefore the reference was annotated and no longer considered prior art in that and remanded uh, for the purposes along with that to PTAB. So one of those, yay for the good uh, diligence uh, declarations. A PAPS licensing versus Samsung. Uh, petitioner had a uh, petition for several IPRs. The PTAB, prior to the PTAB decision on a specific patent, uh, had found two related patents that shared the same spec as unpatentable. So there was a previous IPR proceeding where there was the same spec. PTAB had found these two related patents um, unpatentable, and this is the issue preclusion. Uh, what's going on. And uh, with those two, uh, the patent owner voluntarily dismissed um, uh, before oral argument. However, the Federal Circuit held that PAP's arguments with regards to the 437 patent were barred by issue preclusion. Um, and I put in quotation marks. So everyone uh, that doesn't remember what it was or might call it by a different name, essentially, which prevents the party from relitigating the issue once it has been decided in a previous case. Uh, held issue preclusion generally applies to PDAB decisions. Once those decisions become final, if the other requirements of issue preclusion are met. The prior proceedings uh, of those two related patents resolved, were resolved against PAPS or the patent owner, included material identically issues of claim construction as applied to identical prior art as in the 437. And these determinations were essential to PTAB's prior decisions. So issue preclusion does um, have a place within PTAB, and you have to be aware of uh, the common specs, uh, whether or not, um, and it, it voluntarily dismissed its appearance on the two related patents before oral argument. My apologies, as it should be said, uh, dismissed its appearance on the two related patents before oral argument. Um, so we have something there that shows that we need to have, um, be wary of issue preclusion um, on related families of cases. So uh, this, this Henny Penny case actually involves uh, multiple theories of um, obviousness. So what had happened in this is uh, petitioner, Petition for an IPR under obviousness. Um, the PTAB had determined or challenged the claim or determined that the challenge claims were not unpatentable. In other words, uh, they were, you know, held to be patentable. Penny Penny had, and what had happened is um, petitioner advanced the first theory in its petition and then a second obviousness theory in its reply reason uh, that there was a technical issue or um, what it basically had happened in the answer uh, stage, the um, patent owner was able to advance that, hey, whatever petitioner is advancing, this, it won't work. Um, it's going to be very, very difficult. And so um, the first theory faced a challenge, um, a challenge technical reason related to replacement and the second theory argued replacement was unnecessary. So you take it, you take the first theory and say, well, it's going to just be simply a manipulation or replacement of this piece for this other piece. Answer comes back from the patent owner. No, no. Um, here's what it is. It's a sound technical reasoning um, provided by the patent owner. And in this, in the reply, um, they advance the second theory, which says, okay, well, replacement is actually unnecessary based upon this. Um, Federal Circuit said, no, no, IPR petitioner may not raise in, a, uh, in reply an entirely new rationale for why a claim would have been obvious. 
and also agreed with the board that the substantial evidence supports finding of no patentabil unpatentability related to the first theory. So here's one of the first uh, time bar, uh, 315B uh, time bar issues um, on semiconductor petitioned uh, for an IPR uh, for a patent owner. Uh, PTAB Institute found the claims at issue to be unpatentable. Um, patent owner argued that the IPR should not have been instituted under 315B because previously um, there was another company, which was Fairchild, entered into an agreement to merge with the petitioner. After the agreement, but before the merger, so before the official merger, but um, the petitioner did file several IPR petitions, including the patent asserted against Fairchild, including a patent that was previously as, uh, asserted against Fairchild, uh, the merging, one of the uh, companies that was involved in uh, the merger, uh, Fairchild, and of course it was outside of this uh, 315 time limit that we have, so it was maybe a year or two beforehand. Um, but PTAB rejected um, because the power integrations arguments or the patent owner's arguments, because there was no evidence set forth that um, Fairchild had asserted control over the uh, petitioner or over the petitioner or even in the petition itself. Um, relevant portion of 315B states that an IPR petitioner may not rise in reply. Uh, sorry. Um, that's a misstatement there, but it takes into account the consideration of a privity that rises after the filing of a petition, but before institution. The statute bars institution, not filing of the petition. So um, what's important there is that you have the statute, um, it, it bars the institution and not the filing of the petition. So because they were able to get it in there, um, it, you know, Federal Circuit took into account that the consideration of privity arises after the filing, uh, but before the institution. So that's something to remember. And it, a lot of these cases that we're seeing right now is all about the privity and, and so forth. And here's one of those cases that actually did come out last week, uh, last Thursday, February 13th, 2020, to be exact, um, where uh, the, the facts that come up to this is that Acoustic sued um, ITRON in the early 2000s. This is again a merger uh, situation. The patent owner, Acoustic, then sued Silver Springs Networks and Silver Spring timely filed two IPR petitions. So Silver Spring, they, they filed their petitions after getting sued. Um, however, several weeks before several Silver Spring filed the petitions, um, Silver Spring and ITRON discussed possible merger. Silver Spring and ITRON completed that merger in January 5th of 2018 while the RPR proceedings remained underway. Acoustic learned of the merger three days later and additionally uh, Silver Spring filed the updated mandatory notices that listed ITRON as a real party in interest. Um, the board entered the final written decisions on August 21st of 2018 nearly a year after Silver Spring and ITRON agreed to merge and seven months after they completed the merger. Acoustic appealed the first, uh, arguing that ITRON is a real party in interest. However, the Federal Circuit found that the Acoustic, the patent owner, waived its time bar challenges because it did not present those before the board. So Acoustic had found out about it, had taken into account uh, or uh, had found out about it. Um, Silver Spring filed these updated mandatory notices that listed the real party of interest, but Acoustic continued and waived, um, and, and or the Federal Circuit found that they waived it because they didn't bring it up to uh, the board at the time. What this, and so they talk about uh, in this decision, the efficiencies that this brings and, and so forth. For example, um, you know, you could be just waiting or patent owners could be waiting until um, their final decisions. And if it's um, something that comes up and is positive to the patent owner, well, they didn't have to bring it up. Well, 
maybe they, maybe they could appeal it afterwards and not have to utilize that time bar challenge. And that was one of the things that the federal circuit took into consideration and talked about in their decision of the judicial efficiency of needing to be able to bring up everything within that. Now, what this decision did not do is it did not revolve ITRON's pre-merger activities, uh, render it a real party in interest, or whether the party has any authority or obligation to evaluate 315B uh, post-institution. Um, another case that came out uh, was in Ray Google. Um, this was a venue issue, and this came out uh, again, last Thursday, Google sued in the Eastern, was sued in the Eastern District of Texas. Um, it had a number of servers and data centers, which are importantly not owned by Google. So they rented space within an internet service provider. It contracted out um, within the Eastern District of Texas uh, internet service provider and put some servers there. Uh, Google had filed a writ of mandamus to dismiss for, dismiss for lack of venue. Uh, Quickly, the Federal Circuit reviewed these Cray factors, and this was a, a what 2017 case. Uh, there are three general requirements establishing that a defendant has. So, in order for venue, there must be uh, three general requirements under Cray to establish that a defendant has a regular and established place of business. One, there must be a physical place in the district. It must be a regular and established place of business and it must be the place of the defendant. Now, of course, they went through, walked through, and, you know, uh, talked about, you know, hey, we're renting space. Um, it's not really physically in there. And uh, Google's petition really centered around that the court's inquiry of whether the defendant has a physical place of business should focus on whether the defendant has real property ownership or at least hold interest in real property. Federal Circuit kind of waved its finger at this and said, no, no, um, this would be kind of, someone shouldn't have a real property interest or at least hold interest. Think of the person with the card table at the flea market. It, when they set it up, um, they would potentially be someone that is uh, a physical place of business, even though that they might be someplace that they could easily um, move. Uh, they're going to be able to pick up their card table uh, and move it to another place or another flea market outside of hand. But uh, this is one of those um, analogies that the Federal Circuit uh, panel had used. But they did on the second uh, advanced theory from Google, or th the theory that it, Google had advanced, was that the regular and established place of business requires regular physical presence of an employee or other agent of the defendant conducting the defendant's business at the alleged place of business. So this came under agent theory, and the Federal Circuit took a look at the facts to see what, if um, all the factors of whether or not these ISP providers or the ISP employees were um, agents um, with under under the certain uh, criteria that's set forth in that in that arena. Well, taking a look at what the contract was, um, Federal Circuit said no; that these were merely you know, essentially contractors that weren't under the control of Google. You know, they, um, these contractors, if they had to repair the data centers or the servers or had to repair the servers within the data center, they'd have specific instructions that they would receive from Google. So they took a look at what the contract set forth and the contract was set forth such that Google um, had to provide them all these instructions and so forth. And they, they were not, uh, at the end of the day, it was not an agent uh, of Google. And therefore, uh, the case was either going to have to be dismissed or a change of venue uh, to be, uh, to, to move forward. Now, this is a new case that came out yesterday. And it's interesting because it deals with patent marking. Um, 
as we may all be aware of, Section 287A um, requires, or well, basically, uh, patentee may give notice to the public that the product is patented by fixing thereon the word patent. In the event of failure uh, to do so, no damages shall be recovered by the patentee in any action for infringement except on proof that the infringer was notified of the infringement and continued to infringe thereafter, in which event damages may be recovered only for infringement occurring after such notice. Filing of an action of infringement constitutes such notice. So you have your constructive notice and actual notice. Um, your constructive notice starts when you apply the word patent to your product. And it's in this, you know, once the, the product is in the stream of com uh, commerce, you're marking patent on those words and so forth, or patent, the words patent on your product, uh, that constitutes a constructive notice. But if you have not done so, this, this statute, you know, basically says no damages shall be recovered until basically there's actual notice. Um, actual notice can include filing of an action for infringement. So the issue presented in this case was whether the uh, ceased sales of unmarked products excuses noncompliance with the notice requirement such that the patentee may recover damages for the period after sales of the unmarked product ceased, but before the filing of a suit for infringement. The Federal Circuit held that to begin recovering damages after sales of an unmarked product have begun, basically the end of the day, what you need to know is patentee has to either begin marking its products or provide actual notice to an alleged infringer. Ceasing the sales of unmarked products is not enough. Um, the way to think about this is mark the stuff that provides you uh, constructive notice. If you don't, you have to provide actual notice to the alleged infringer and bring them up. This did bring up another point. Um, oh, let's uh, close the loop first because before we get to that additional point, um, the uh, court requires notice requirement is subjected and cannot be switched on and off as the patent or licensee starts or stops making or selling the product. After all, even after the patentee ceases sales of unmarked product, nothing precludes the patentee from resuming sales or authorizing the licensee uh, to do so. Um, you know, so, so at the end of the day, what patent owners or um, even having the licensee as well um, mark the products um, in order to have your instructive uh, notice on place. What's interesting in this is that the jury found uh, that it was willfully infringed under 35 USC 286. However, the panel, the Federal Circuit reiterated that willfulness, even as an indication that the, the, the infringer knew of the patent and its infringement does not serve as actual notice as contemplated by 287. So bottom line is, the willful infringement, which would have been noticed, or I mean, it would have uh, been evidence that they were aware that this patent was out there, um, is not still actual notice as contemplated by 287. Um, and, and here's an interesting uh, PTAB decision uh, that was in uh, Bloomberg Law just a few weeks ago and uh, found it pretty interesting. Um, this Emerson Electric versus SIPCO. What this involves is related to certificate of corrections, and it's quite a convoluted fact pattern, or not really convoluted, but interesting fact pattern. But um, it centers around on whether certificate of correction can have retroactive effect. Retroactive effect. Essentially, what happened is that the patent owner um, was IPR'd, and the patent at issue. Uh, the priority claim was incorrect. And essentially what they wanted to do was get a certificate of correction issued such that they could um, remove that prior art reference because there was a prior art reference that uh, basically in came in between the priority date or the earliest priority date that they could have had and the date that it was actually afforded um, that, that patent. So um, the 
facts to know about this is that there were multiple petitions to correct priority claim uh, to remove the prior art. Um, the initial petition filed nearly one month after uh, after the petition was filed. So the IPR petition was filed. Um, the initial certificate of correction was filed one month after that one. However, patent owner did not inform the board. And um, it was actually, I'm sorry, the patent owner, yeah, the patent owner did not inform the board of uh, this petition to, to correct priority. It was the petitioner who informed the board after the petitioner found out about it on pair. Um, patent owner actually, well, long story short, the initial petition was, um, uh, there was something incorrect in it. So, um, patent owner sought authorization from the board for the next two petitions that they filed because um, the, this, there was an error in the second one um, and they were actually um, allowed, so the board did allow the patent owner uh, to try and get that one. They did sought, seek authorization of the, for the third one. However, that was, you know, basically it was a show cause. Why, you know, should we do this? Why should we suspend everything? Well, long story short, there were additional petitions. Uh, there might have been four or five petitions in total that needed to be filed for the certificate of correction. Um, the certificate of correction, long story short, was issued after the final decision was issued by the PTAB. Um, the magic language in 255 that PTAB was looking at was that um, such patent together with the certificate shall have the same effect in operation law on trials of action for causes thereafter rising as if it had been originally issued. Um, long, uh, uh, what the patent owner was arguing is that IPRs are not trials of action for causes. However, the PTAB had actually focused on the thereafter rising that, that to find that the statute means um, not retroactive, but prospective application. So thereafter rising, um, the certificate of correction can only be good uh, looking forward and not backward. They additionally compared the language to 256, which involves the error in admitting inventors or naming persons who are not inventors shall not invalidate the patent in which such occur, uh, error occurred. So they took that as the, the PTAB had looked at the language of 256, shall not invalidate the patent as a retroactive application and therefore they said you know comparing this language which is kind of sister with 255 thereafter arising 256 focuses on a, a retroactive and prospective application of it whereas uh, the the language does not track in 255 so there was two pieces there that they were uh, taking a look at and with that, um, we have reached our conclusion, and I'm happy to answer any questions that you may have, or here's my email address if you think of these after the fact. another minute or so. But again, feel free to reach out to me at Benson at B2IPLaw.com. And um, I truly appreciate everyone joining today. And um, oh, oh, please provide the PTAB case number. Uh, I assume that that is the um, Oh, for the decision issued two days ago? Absolutely. Um, one second here. I do.